My name is Tamara Mori Housley, and family means to me unconditional love. Hello, and welcome to We Are Family. I'm your host, Julia Dennison, and joining me today is Emmy winning host, actress, producer, and author Tamara Mori Housley. She, along with her twin <laughs> sister, Tia Mori, were the stars of the 90s hit sitcom Sister Sister, and along with acting, branding, being a parent, co hosting the daytime talk show The Real, and so much more. Her new book coming out this fall is called You Should Sit Down for This A Memoir About Wine, Life, and Cookies. I know we're going to get to some of those things today. Hopefully all three. That would be nice. But without further ado, please welcome Tamara to We Are Family. Hi, Tamara. Hi. I am so excited to be here. So happy to have you. So I wanted to start by asking about an Instagram story you had the other day about making honey. Honey, my daughter (laughs) is six and she is be obsessed right now. Mm -hmm. So tell me a little bit about that. I'm so curious. Well, bees are, as you know, they're very important to our environment. And I will say I've learned a lot just about nature when I moved to Napa. My husband was born and raised here. And, you know, living in Los Angeles, you have, uh, I, I pretty much grew up there. I was born in Germany, but lived most of my life. I moved there when I was 11 and I just moved away from Los Angeles about three years ago. So right before the pandemic, you know, you have the farm to table lifestyle that is very, very trendy in Los Angeles. But here in Northern California, it is their way of life. The children are taught at a very young age about gardening about where the food that they eat comes from. And I absolutely loved that because it's really important. It's, it's, you know, it was how we basically got our produce years and years and years ago. We had our own land, you know, gardens. And to just go back to that, it's amazing. And my husband and I, we recently just bought property where we're going to grow some more grapes because we're in the wine business. We produce olive oil. We obviously have wine. And now we're going to do honey. Oh so goodness, that's he, amazing. It's awesome. And it's really cool. He's crazy, though, because he, he didn't even have like the gear on and everything. And I was like, you're going to get stung. You know, it's a part of the it's part of life. They, they get stung maybe three or four times, you know, the, oh the beekeepers. Goodness. Uh, but he did not get stung. And I'm not playing those games. So I'm going to stay far, far away. <laughs> I love it. So h- how old are your kids now? I have a nine-year-old who can't wait to be 10. You know how it is. Uh-huh. And a six-year-old who, her name is Araya. Aiden is is nine. Araya's turning seven pretty soon. Oh, wow. So, yeah, mm-hmm. my daughter my daughter just turned six. So, and Aww. she's, now, because you're in in Napa and because of the farm to table and all the amazing, wonderful food you were talking about. My daughter is sometimes somewhat of a picky eater at six. She's getting there. But um, how about your kids? Are they adventurous eaters? Do you get them eating (laughs) everything that you're growing in the land there? Well, my daughter, yes, because I learned the hard way. My son is the picky eater. And I'll tell you a little trick that I did with my daughter. My daughter absolutely loves cauliflower by itself and celery. Who would have ever thought that? Those are the two foods that I still, like, I just learned to love cauliflower. Cauliflower is, you know, everything right now. Cauliflower, pizza crust. I mean, so they found many, many ways for us to enjoy cauliflower. But she likes it raw by itself. The first three months of her eating solid foods, I only fed her vegetables. So she really, you know, got to love. Normalized it. Mm-hmm, that taste so that when we started, uh, you know, putting fruit in her diet, she was like, ooh, what is this? But she had already loved vegetables. So Aiden, I did like pears, apples, like <laughs> immediately. And uh, he is my picky eater. But you know what? Ever since he took a gardening class, he became a little bit more open. Okay. Oh, so that mm-hmm. well, to your point, like, and you must get that a lot. That's nice about living in Napa is you get the access yes. to the gardening. And I really, I've heard that before that actually getting them in, involved in the process of creating the food is a really big help with getting them to eat. And to get them to communicate why they love the foods they like and why these particular foods that they may not like you know, are, real, are really important to them, to, to their growth. So my, my son is really into sports right now. So I tell him, all right, you want to be like Brandon Belt? 
on, you know, the San Francisco Giants, you have to eat your vegetables so you can grow and you can be a great pitcher. You can be a great catcher. That's helping him. He's like, okay, well, uh, I'll try apples. And I'm like, okay, I'll take it. <laughs> but he's into textures. And that's what okay. it is. He finally communicated to me. He was like, mommy, I don't like the way that feels on my tongue. Right. So, so. you're like, ding, ding, ding. Okay. We have a, like a little bit yeah. of an answer here. So let's rewind and talk a little bit about your childhood. So you were saying you grew up in Germany. Your parents were in the army, right? They were both sergeants. Yes. What was your childhood like? Do you think that that informed their parenting? Tell, tell me a little bit about growing up over there. <laughs> 100%. We lived in a very assertive, structured, uh, disciplined home, but it wasn't aggressive. It was mixed with that unconditional love and, and warmth and that structure helped me be the person that I am today. One thing that people can say for all the Maury's that work in the industry is that we have an amazing work ethic. And also we're very sociable because we moved around a lot. So I was born in Germany. I lived in Hawaii from three to eight, uh, Texas eight to 11 and from 11 till now, you know, in, in California. It taught us because we moved around a lot to not be afraid to be the new kid in school. And we did have each other. Thank God I had my twin with me when we moved to, you know, the different schools. Um, but I, 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 I learned a skill to just communicate, to talk, to adapt. So whenever I'm in a room, I, I'm not the one that's kind of like, mm, you know, shy right. in, in the corner. I'm like, hey, what's up? My name is. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what advice being a twin would you give to, uh, to parents raising twins in terms of like fostering that independence? Where do you find that line? Because do people make assumptions about you as twins that you could read each other's oh my thoughts gosh, that they, you were like? <laughs> they still do. My <laughs> sister and I laugh so hard because people can see just one of us and they'll go, what's up, Tia and Tamara? And my <laughs> sister's like, Tamara's here? Oh, 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 Okay. <laughs> and the same thing would happen to me. So one of the things that my mom did very well and my dad early on is they taught us, even though we dressed alike, we dressed alike till we were like, I want to say 14, 15, but it was by choice. Mm -hmm. It was something that we wanted to do. Um, she celebrated the fact that we were, you know, twins. It, it is, you know, something very rare, you know, special. But at the same time, she wanted us to celebrate our individuality, to celebrate our our differences. And as we got older and moved in with each other, my sister and I lived with each other for about seven years when we moved outside of uh, my parents' house. We really, really, really started to notice like, wow, we may look alike, <laughs> but we are different. Mm -hmm. We see the world differently. We act differently. And for a while, I will say we tried to get the other one to be like the other one because there was safety there moving away mm -hmm. from our parents. That was challenging. But it wasn't until we kind of just accepted that we are different and it's okay. We call mm -hmm. each other the yin and the yang to our, our relationship. The perfect way to describe it is I'm a little bit of California. Tia is a little bit New York. Uh -huh. So w whenever we were in a room, I was the talker. I love people. Tia was the business one. So mm. she could see already into the future, the things that needed to happen. And she really learned how to say no quicker than I did. Okay. Whereas, you know, I was the people pleaser. We would work hand in hand and, and, uh, now we celebrate that she has her own brand. I have my own brand. She's doing her own thing. And when we come together, uh, hopefully one day, I would love to, to, to work with her again. But in life, it is, oh my gosh, it is a dynamic and it is so much fun. So definitely celebrate y your twins differences and it is okay yeah. to, to, to be different. So thinking about sister, sister, what was that like working together? Would you ever let your kids be in show business from a young age? What was your sort of takeaway growing up as, you know, being in the limelight from so young? <laughs> I absolutely loved it from the beginning. Again, our parents really, they taught us the importance of this is a dream of yours that, that actually happened. What a blessing. Things come and go, though. 
-hmm. You know, your business is very fickle. So they taught us at a very young age to enjoy and soak up every single moment. Now, one of the most struggling parts about being a child actor is the pressure. You know, once you are a hit show and you're aware of it, you want to keep it that way. And in reality, what what's in will once be, you know, out, meaning it'll get canceled one day. Mm. Um, and then also um, looking at the ratings, you have to learn to not take that personal. And we didn't have social media back then. Thank God. Oh, I God, really yeah, feel for true. the children who, who have that then. But we did mm -hmm. have fan mail. Mm -hmm. And I talk about that in my book. There was one thing that a person said that was very negative that stuck with me for ever, like mm -hmm. until now. And, and I made it a part of my identity. So that was very, very hard learning the difference between constructive criticism mm -hmm. and someone's opinion and the difference between an opinion and a fact. Mm hmm. Yeah, I really feel for the kids that have to read the comments. Um, I On a previous episode, I, I spoke to Billie, Billie Eilish's mother, and that's something that, like, it's so much. It's one, It's enough to grow up in the in the limelight like that. It's another thing to have to read all the comments. It is. It's hard and enough And my children, adults. I know, they both want to do it. So they want to be in the entertainment business. So right now I'm just trying to build – that foundation of enjoying being a child. I think it's very important that having survived Hollywood, that you don't let what you do define who you are as a person. Mm -hmm. You know, my mom taught us the janitor at a high school, you know, is, is just as human and as important to <laughs> you and the world as we are. Mm -hmm. You know, so as people in the industry, so it's really important. Thinking about how you and your husband, Adam, both parent, do you feel like you play different roles? Like what's your parenting style? Are you on the same page? So I have learned that I am the disciplinarian <sighs> in my household. Mm -hmm. Adam is, I don't want to say he's a pushover, <laughs> <laughs> But I think it's weird because when people see me in life, they see that, you know, I can be very, very kind, very, very sweet. I'm, I'm getting better with people pleasing. Yeah. Um, but when it comes to my children and it comes to the discipline, I am the complete opposite because I have this saying, it's very important for me to discipline our children, the parents to discipline the children instead of the world, because mm -hmm. the world is going to be not as unconditional <laughs> right? as we are. So let's get back to your book. So it's coming out this yes. fall. It's very exciting. Yes. But I love the title. Thank you should, you. you should, the whole title is just so amazing. Like, thank you. You should sit down for this a memoir about wine life and cookies. Like immediately yes. that is like, hello, everyone will want to read that now. Oh, that is me so a little, cool. Thank you. <laughs> can you talk to me a little bit about the impetus for writing the book? And like, even the title feels like you're about to sit down and share some gossip, which I like. Where did that idea come from for the title and, you know, the whole book generally? I have always wanted to write a book after I was on The Real, I would say, for about uh, three years. Doing The Real in the beginning taught me that there is, you know, this whole world of, of people who are really hanging on to every word that you have to say, good and bad. Mm -hmm. meaning there are people waiting to attack and to respond because you think differently. And there are people resonating with you mm -hmm. because you are vulnerable. There's something that happens when you feel that you aren't alone. Mm -hmm. Someone gets you. And because of your personal experience, you've helped someone else. So the moment I realized that, I thought, okay, I want to write a book. But I didn't want to write a book just to write a book. I wanted to make sure that the timing was right and I had enough stories to tell. So the moment I turned 40, mm -hmm. that's when the idea of doing a memoir started kind of like resonating because I, 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 I've noticed these kind of phases in my life and I wanted to share it and my thing is, is yes, you've heard stories of me on the reel for six years, 
but you, you haven't heard the whole story. Mm -hmm. And one of my favorite things to do is to entertain people. And uh, that is kind of like how the book starts out. It's I invite you to my like living room to my space. And I am always the person that is going to offer you wine. And my favorite thing to do at parties is to have wine and cookies. So by the time dessert, you know, comes around, I, I always have that, that glass of wine too. What's better than wine and cookies? That sounds like the best party ever. I know. <laughs> I'm turning 40 in August. So I love um, your point about mm -hmm. just that being a moment in your life to reflect. And, yes. you know, especially as a, as a mother and like, I feel like as a mother, you wear so many different hats and like, yes. you know, trying to maintain your own personality, your own individuality as a twin. And then also as a mother, it's like, there's just so many and sides. And like as a, as a spouse too, as you spouse, have to like- yeah. Sometimes it all just merges <laughs> yeah. together or you lose a little bit of your identity. I feel mm -hmm. like as women, when we become a mother, just women in general, we always want to take care of other people. Mm -hmm. So when you're a mom, sometimes you just, you're so focused on the children and then you're like, oh crap, I wait, no, I, I'm a wife. Oh, there right. you are. My husband, you right. know, right. and then it's usually the third one is you coming back to yourself. Mm -hmm. You go, wait a minute. What about my needs? <laughs> right? <laughs> I forgot who I yeah. was. But uh, <laughs> it's so I can true. totally relate to that. Yeah. Um, so now running a winery is so cool. Did you know much about wine other than you enjoyed it before you, you started that process? I feel like it's an industry that takes so much patience. Is that a trait that you feel like you, you had already? Or is it taught um, you the concept of well, waiting for something let to get me just really good? You, <laughs> I had no idea what I was getting into. Okay. Having a winery, yes, it is romantic. It seems, you know, ideal. It's a great... Um, I always say it's my retirement job, um, but it's a lot of hard work. Yeah. And yes, it takes a lot of patience. One, to just, I mean, make the wine. You, the grapes obviously have to be fermented. And then the other is, you know, starting up a winery, you, you normally don't even see a profit until like 10 years. So you have to make sure that it definitely is a passion and um, I mean, it, obviously, you, you have different types of winery or, you know, you have boutique, you have mass, you have, you know, there are celebrities sometimes that just slap their names on it, have mm -hmm. other people do it. No, I got married. I married into it. The real deal, the real thing. <laughs> and my husband, you know, he is taken over the, the family business. So mm -hmm. my father in law, Art, was the one who started it over 20 years ago. And uh, he asked me, all right, is this something that, you know, we want to do? And I said, yeah. And I don't want to just be the wife of a, you know, husband whose family has a winery. I really mm -hmm. want to be involved. I really want to know how to make wine, you know, what it's all about. It is mind blowing. I am constantly um, learning. We have so many different varietals, which is awesome. So I learned, you know, the difference of the Pinot Noir, the Chardonnay, mm -hmm. the the Cab, and the differences of how uh, the grapes are grown, like the soil is yeah. very, very important. And there are a lot of, uh, I would say, life lessons learned in just making wine. Right? <laughs> yeah. So it's very fulfilling. Mm-hmm. Very that's, fulfilling. That's awesome. And then mm -hmm. also super popular with, with our audience is The Masked Singer, which you were obviously on last year. Yes. It's so popular. It's amazing. And it looks so fun. Was it super fun? What was that experience like? Okay. So I cried every <laughs> single time I got on stage. Okay. Um, <laughs> and my friend Adrian Houghton, who did it before, uh, she was the flamingo. She was mm -hmm. the one who said, Tamara, you need to do it. You know, I was like, I don't know. I'm nervous. I haven't sang on a stage like, a, you know, like really performed in, in over like 20 years. I don't know what the hell I'm doing. She's like, Tamara, but you have a great voice. You just need to do it. You'll learn a lot about yourself. And she was like, but I did want to throw up every single time I, went on, <laughs> I stepped on the stage. She was not lying. Oh, my gosh. Holy hell. <laughs> um, 
I, like I said, I cried because I wanted to quit every single mm-hmm. time. It's, it's crazy because it's literally you and the mask who you are really competing against. You can hear the other people sing, you know, before they go on, yeah. but you're competing against yourself. And I feel like that's mm. the reason why that show is so successful. Imagine going out there with this big mask on and singing and having to perform. You, they say you can see, but you can't see. It was insane. But I will say I'm a different person having done it. Okay. Like, okay. I, whenever I'm like nervous to do something, to start a new film or to do a scene and think I'm going to suck, I go, you know what, Tamara? You were on Mass Singer and you made the semifinals. Okay. <laughs> if you did that, you can do anything. That's amazing. Oh my goodness. Yes. <laughs> Another area that's popular with our, our audience is 90s nostalgia, obviously, and because so much of our mm-hmm. audiences grew up with you. How do you feel like seeing the 90s come back again into fashion? And do you feel like there's like a new sort of resurgence with like popularity around Sister Sister happening? And what's that all like? Anything you miss from the 90s? Oh, my gosh. Yes. I will say this, though. Um, Growing up in the 80s and 90s. Okay, so the 80s, the 80s were a moment. You know what I mean? Like a moment. Uh The 90s, I feel like were just iconic because I mean, I can say that personally, because, you know, we had the different shows um, that are now making a a comeback like Sister Sister. Mm -hmm. What's insane is is yes yeah, seeing the fashion i'm like doc martin hello i wore those way before <laughs> the overalls right and even my hair like my hair today i was like tamara do you want to do this like put it in yes. a bun and they're like <laughs> I, I love like, it yes this uh-huh. is what we did and this it's... is what people are doing now. we gotta own it we were all there first you that you especially yes i <laughs> absolutely i love it it's nostalgic it's awesome mm-hmm. and to see these young children I mean well I call them children <laughs> uh, but they were like you know like yeah. 16 year olds I mm-hmm. remember just being in a doctor's office and and hearing the theme song to sister sister this girl was waiting for um her brother to come out and she was like 16 her brother was a you know younger baby and I was waiting for my appointment she had sister sister on her iPad oh my and gosh. I was like she has no idea <laughs> that I am sitting right here should I say something? And I did. Oh, good I went, for you. hey, are you watching Sister Sister? She looked up and she was like, <gasps> like double date. <laughs> yeah. Oh, <God. laughs> She's like, this is a great show. And I was like, oh, thank you. Yay. That's pretty cool. It does yeah. have universal appeal. I love that. Yeah. I think it's really cool. <laughs> um, we're wrapping up now. Coming on the last question I ask everybody. Obviously, it's been a really tough year these last two years for parents, for everybody. What is your kind of biggest hope for your family for the next couple of years in the future? I would say, <laughs> um, <laughs> no pressure. Just, uh, I know, right? Because there's so many things, but I'll, mm-hmm. as you can see, I'm very loquacious. I talk a lot. Um, but but uh, if I had to pick one thing, is I want to teach my children, and I want to make sure that our household practices empathy. Mm -hmm. empathy is something we need so desperately in this world yes because you know there's sympathy but empathy is when you're able to uh, I always say have you know these these feelings of wanting to help someone without knowing or, or, or without going through what they went through it's it's just having a genuine sense of care Mm -hmm. and um, compassion for the human race, you know? And and I feel like that is, you know, that could be very, you know, broad, but that's the thing. Mm -hmm. We can use empathy in anything Mm -hmm. as a teacher, as a friend, as a mother, as as a spouse, as a doctor, as a, you know, psychologist. The importance of teaching them, you know, to take care of your 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 mental health. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, that that is my main main thing right I now. I love that. I think empathy is the yeah. most important too. I agree. Well, Tamara, thank you so much for coming on. We are family. It's been such a pleasure to talk to you. Oh, thank you. This is this is this was awesome. Yay! But, thank you. Thank you. 
Thanks so much for listening. Be sure to follow We Are Family on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen so you don't miss an episode. And we'd love your feedback. If you could rate this podcast and leave us a review, we'd really appreciate it. You can also find us online at parents.com slash wearefamilypodcast. Tune in to all our episodes during this season with Michael Ian Black, Phil Rosenthal, and Tamara Mowry Housley. And if you missed any of our previous episodes in seasons one and two, they're waiting for you right now. This season of We Are Family is presented by me, Julia Dennison, and produced by Jim Hankey. Editing is by Jason Mack. And thanks also to our production team at Pod People, Rachel King, Matt Sav, and Danielle Roth.